For tonight, we have a very special presenter and presentation. He is well loved and known throughout the National Health Service Corps. His name is one and only Dr. Corey Abear. And tonight's topic <laughs> is implementing a public health initiative in your community. Just to, sh to share a little bit about um, Dr. Abear's experience. Okay, my screen just went blank. I apologize. So Dr. Abear will be sharing a little bit about his background. <laughs> um, tonight's presentation, we're going to have question and answers that will go on throughout his presentation. And so if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Feel free to type in your questions and or comments as they arise and click the submit button and he will get to them as they come up throughout the presentation. So with all of that said, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Corey Abear. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I need to tell you about my tell everyone about myself, uh, and that's a good thing, I guess, because you know doctors uh, a lot of times are uh, not eagle maniacal people. <laughs> that's just a joke. Anyway, um, Dr. Corey Abe, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, professor of Pediatrics and Emergency Medicine at Tulane University uh, Medical Center. I actually do practice. I'm a CEO of Black Health Television. Uh, as well as a um, uh, the uh, chief medical officer for the recovery school district for the state of Louisiana, which is the largest school district in the state, which is about 150 schools. Uh, also, uh, I'm a National Health Service Corps scholar. I did my uh, my service in the same area where I still practice. Uh, and uh, a couple of things that make me a little bit unique is that I'm one of the doctors for NBC, so I'm a chief medical editor for NBC Television News uh, for the Gulf South region. Uh, I'm one of the doctors for the Dr. Oz TV show. I'm a contributor for that show as well as the uh, Discovery Channel show, How Stuff Works, and also the Lifetime Television Network show called The Balancing Act. Uh, so I do a lot of stuff, and um, I need to... Um, say a little something about uh, about my uh, affiliation but I'm not being able to advance my slides so let's see if that'll do it there we go implementing a public health initiative in your community and there are my uh, credentials on the screen and once again I'm Dr. Corey Abear. So before I get started, I have to read a disclosure statement. Uh, in compliance with the American Academy of Family Physicians guidelines, I hereby declare that I do have a financial or other relationship with the manufacturer of a commercial or service product, number one being GlaxoSmithKline and number two being Novartis, none of which uh, will be uh, talked about in this presentation. So with that being said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up just one second and say, um, you guys uh, are in a very interesting place. Uh, healthcare is changing so much, and everything is going on uh, around you. But you're still in your either your training or your uh, your time giving back to the to the core. And it's very important that you guys realize that uh, we want you to stay. We want you to be a part of the National Health Service Corps. We want you to to uh, to once you finish your commitment we want you to stay for a really long time many many years I've been in my site now for about 14 years and I don't think I'll be going anywhere soon uh, but I will tell you that uh, everyone when you go to these conferences some of you may have seen me at one of the conferences talking about uh, the things that I, I do to try to keep me focused and the things that I do to try to get me inspired um, but uh, unless you went to a small group session you only heard about my colossal successes and with a lot of times uh, people really um, talk about their colossal successes when they're in big group settings. I tend to talk about them as well. However, in small group settings, I'd like to talk about the things that uh, were some of my colossal failures because I learned a lot more from my colossal failures than I learned from my colossal successes. Um, so with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the primary goals of a community initiative. We know that people always, they inspire you and tell you all these great things and tell you that you're the best and that you're the smartest and that you, you know, work hard and all these things. And so you take all this stuff and they give you all these interesting, um, interesting information, interesting programs that you can use. Um, and what I'm thinking about, um, when I, I talk about this is that uh, they never tell you how to get something started. They never tell you the steps you need 
to actually get to the goal of, of what you're trying to achieve. They just tell you that you know they started an outreach program where they have a teen pregnancy program and it's funded and it's got $100,000 funded every year by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or whatever. And you're just like, how in the heck did you actually get to do that? So that's what this is about tonight, okay? We're gonna talk about the, um, the goals of a community initiative. So the first thing we know is that we want to improve community health. We always want to do that. That's our main goal. We want to involve the community. We want to use the community-based participatory research to do that. We want to use research and data. We don't want to forget what we already know. And things that are very important, the steps to make it happen. Develop an initial statement of the issue. Quantify the issue. Research the issue. Develop the program or policy options create implementation plan and evaluate the program or policy. Now, um, pop back one second here because when you look at the things we talked about before, using research and data, people do not like to use research and data because we're clinicians. We just like to see the patients and we like the, the, uh, the other people, the statisticians to do all the research. But I will tell you, you can actually team up with the statistician and do that research but you will not ever be able to get funded ever until you learn that you have to use uh, research and data to get your uh, point across. So we'll go to these. The initial statement, we went through all these, but if you look at the things that are being highlighted, the things that are most important, developing an initial statement of the issue. You have to quantify the issue and research the issue. Those are the big things. Now, it's kind of interesting. I got a, uh, a call today from D.C. because uh, there was an earthquake in D.C. And uh, I've done lots of studies and been funded on post-traumatic stress disorder in children and adolescents. And so uh, I got someone that uh, called me today that wanted to do a, a, a uh, study on the uh, post-traumatic uh, effects of this earthquake. And I asked them, the first thing I said was, what is the issue? Do you really want to know how the kids are doing after this? Or do you really want to know um, how the families are coping? Or, or Because really, when you look at the developing initial statement, that's very difficult. Uh, you also want to quantify the issue. How many kids you want to talk about here? How many times do we have to, to do this to make it statistically significant? Research the issue. What are the people actually saying about why this, uh, what they've done since uh, the, the uh, the earthquake because you know I I'd actually did a lot of research on Hurricane Katrina so you know I have a lot of expertise in this but you know they didn't have all that together they didn't have all these statements of the issues so it became a little bit of an issue for me because I didn't know if I could really do it until they start you know getting their stuff together when uh, when so we could actually do the program the program so step one develop the initial statement what is the health issue a lot of times people don't realize that the health issue what it is and they think it's something that it's not. I mean, we all want to do so many things. We want to do so many things, but we got to think about what are the forces that might shape the issue? Political, personal, social norms. All right. I'll never forget one of the biggest, biggest failures. Um, I wanted to get rid of pit bulls. Now, uh, in my in my city, now um, I do understand that some of you guys out there may have an American Staffordshire Terrier or whatever you call it, um, and 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 I know that the dog is inherently bad, um, and that the people that are you know put. Uh, gunpowder in the dog's food and hot sauce and stuff to make them bad. I know that's that's a bad thing. However, in my personal opinion, in my community, most of the owners of those dogs actually are those people. So the dogs are bad and I've been working in the emergency room for 14 years and I've only seen pit bull attacks. I've never seen any other dog attack in my entire life. So I was trying to get these dogs outlawed. Now in Fulton County, they're outlawed. You have to have a special permit. And uh, in Miami, they're actually outlawed. You have to have a special permit. So I wanted that to be that same way in New Orleans. But guess what I didn't realize? I didn't realize that the president of the, of the city council owned two pit bulls. All right. So at this point, I have a political issue because he said, Corey, now you know that, uh, you know, it's not the dog. It, it's the person. And he was giving me all this yah, yah, yah. But I was trying to explain to him that I don't really care because, okay, granted, he's a millionaire and he's got, you know, great handlers for his dogs. But what about all the people that, you know, have are surrounded by these dogs and get you know have issues so with, with that being said obviously that was a failure because I pushed it and pushed it and pushed it and until he's not the the, um, the city council president uh, that won't ever go through um, so what about personal uh, 
um, social norms, environmental. Let's talk about the immunization distrust or transportation as a barrier. When we uh, we try to do a real you know big deal because we you know they have all these situations with um, with people uh, that have been uh, disenfranchised and, and distrustful of the federal government. You know a lot of the uh, projects in New Orleans uh, they don't. They have very, very bad immunization rates because they're like, I'm not going to be uh, guinea pig for all these vaccines they're causing in, um, autism and all sorts of kind of stuff. So we did a huge outreach program uh, to try to uh, empower people to get vaccination and so education and all this other kind of stuff. But then we realized, wait a minute, all the, all the, uh, the questionnaires we were giving out, they didn't really have this distrust. So what was the problem? We found out that the real problem was the fact that they just didn't have transportation. So all we had to do was buy buses, not buy them but rent them, and take the people to get the vaccines or bring the vaccines to them, and then the, the immunization rates went up to 98%. So sometimes you don't even know what the health issue is because the health issue was not distrust, it was transportation. Uh, another big one that we tried to do was, you know, we wanted to have, uh, there was a dentist who had made his millions and he wanted to give back to the community, so he bought five um, mobile dentist, uh, dentistry trucks, dental hygiene trucks, and he was going to go to the schools and go to a different school every day and um, clean the kids' teeth and then uh, uh, fill the cavities and all that stuff. Well that's a great idea I, you know I'm over the school district so I was all for it and we had gotten all the paperwork we needed but guess who didn't want that the dentists the dentists didn't want that because what was happening all of these dentists were making all their money with these uh, with these little tiny clinics and these clinics were uh, really charging these people an arm and a leg to do this stuff and then it became a real problem so uh, the dentist uh, passed a law that said unless you got uh, uh, approved by the uh, American Dental Association or and the American Dental Association for the state then you couldn't go into a school and do that and, and they would never give that permission so you know what is the initial statement you really need to understand there are a lot of things out there that are going to hold you up so you need to have an initial statement that's very good and very succinct who are the key stakeholders including community members just because someone is a loudmouth doesn't mean he's the key stakeholder Okay, remember that because uh, I'll talk to you about some of my other failures, and we'll know that just because a person is a um, is a loudmouth doesn't mean that they're a real stakeholder. It just means that they're a loudmouth, and they could steer you wrong. So make sure that you know who those stakeholders are. What do you know in general about the problem? Uh, for your first uh, time where you want to do your first initiative, I wouldn't stray outside of your expertise. So for example, if you're a social worker and you're sitting uh, there and you want to talk about the issues with healing uh, after orthopedic surgery, I will try to stay away from anything where you have to learn about stuff because this is already going to be a very frail time for you because you're going to have an ego issue because if this fails, you're going to be very upset. So you don't want to have that, and let me adjust this cam real quick. Okay, and you don't want to um, to have the failure. So the failure is is a, is something that you got to try to stay away from. So if you try to do a bunch of stuff that's just too much, meaning I have to go learn about orthopedic surgery to do my social work implementation, that's not not a good thing. So try to stay in in for your first time. Stay in. Uh, your area of expertise and if you don't want to do that and you want to do something else that's fine just know that it's going to be a little bit more work for you and um, like you guys need more work right number two uh, still number one uh, develop an initial statement of the issue use PICO to divine the question look at your population see if there's been an intervention use your comparisons and look at your outcomes if you don't hear anything I've said tonight please make sure that you use a logic model to begin your strategic planning inputs activities outputs results um, when I, I started working with the, um, the Kellogg Foundation and uh, I was on that board and so they would they get hundreds and hundreds of, of applications for all different types of projects and so one day they give us a sample they gave us a sample and, and I got 10 of them and I looked at those and they said tell us which ones you think you would like and which ones that you think would be good to be funded and which ones wouldn't and so of the five I, I had about five of them that I thought were good and about five of them I thought were bad so when I got the final list I realized the five that I picked 
that were good didn't get funded. The five that I picked that were bad did get funded. So I realized at that point, there's a real problem here. Something's not right because I'm not stupid and I think I can tell, pick out a good program. So um, what ended up happening is that the, uh, they told me that the ones that I picked were good ideas but they didn't follow the logic models. And I was like, what the hell is a logic model? And, you know, basically what it is is, you know, when you submit this, uh, your, your grant proposal to a foundation, there are a bunch of guys or ladies that actually sit there and they um, they say, uh, they, they look at the, the very nuts and bolts of, of what you are presenting. And if you, um, if you look at that and you don't and, and they look at it and didn't follow the actual model then they throw it away okay and I, it's very serious it's very serious because they it's all your work and all you have to do is follow the logic model that that you're supposed to follow and then you wouldn't have the it, it's possibility you would get funded so I was very upset about this because I didn't ever I'd never heard of these logic models and so I, I asked them if they could really maybe um, Published these models, and they said they're already published. They're in books, and I'm like, whatever. Uh, the the point is, they now have a, uh, a a website you can go to, as well as the CDC has websites that you can go to. So when you start looking at your initial statement, I want you guys to go to these websites and look at the logic models and start putting them in the logic model, so that you can actually follow this in the way that they want it to be followed so that you can have a chance to get funded and it's, it doesn't matter if you have a good idea or not and the reason why they do this is because you got to think about it Kellogg is a good company Kraft is a good company they they care but they really want people to feel like that uh, say Kraft uh, or, or Kellogg or Coca-Cola or whatever you know sponsors a, a teen pregnancy program they want everybody to know that Coca-Cola did it of course they want the Teens to teens to not to get pregnant, but they want Coca-Cola to know that more. It, we want everyone to know that Coca-Cola did it. So their job is to say, if you have, if you follow these logic models, the odds of you being funded and the odds of you being successful will be higher. That makes sense to everybody. So that's why they do it. It's just all about a percentage of what uh, generally is successful. So please look at these logic models and, and, and look at them at the beginning of your statement of the issue. Quantify the issue. Now, public health surveillance, we know, is a continuous and systematic process of collection, analysis, interpretation, dissemination, and descriptive of descriptive information on monitoring health problems. Say that fast three times. Um, and it's also for use in public health action to reduce morbidity and mortality and to improve health. Basically, what that means is we have to do research and we have to get the information and quantify all of our research so that we can know that we're doing a good job or a bad job. Now, what do we do well? We quantify the data sources. What do we get very well? We, we actually get um, data from federal agencies, the National Center for Education Statistics. They're okay. Housing and Urban Development, they're okay. EPA, they're very good at giving you information and uh, because they're like, a, obviously, a, a whistleblower agency. So they want to get, they like to stir up trouble. Uh, FBI, obviously, sometimes can give you some statistics on things you may want to do, especially when you're talking about the Bureau of Prisons. Um, but I will tell you, the state and government agencies, those are the ones that actually are the best and the reason why is because um, I'm, so, I'm actually using this little green box little green arrow rather state government agencies because this is these are the people that you could actually know these are the people that you can drive to um, their, uh, their the, the lady or the man that works at that desk in your state capital and they can actually give you the information that you might need and they can they'll look at you and you can actually make eye contact with them and you can and they can you know say look you know it's uh you've been here three times to get this information well we'll give it to you okay so always do that non for profits work pretty well the college and universities work pretty, pretty well a lot of research organizations out there but state government agencies are the where where I get most of the information that I use where do we stand here when we quantify what do we track well births and deaths we track them very well why because there's always somebody that is um, that is uh, writing down who's born and writing down who dies so if you need to find out any of that information you can it's very easy uh, infectious diseases 
Vibrio vulnificus. Have you guys ever heard of Vibrio vulnificus? Well, it's a disease that you get from warm, salty water, which means everywhere in the United States. But a lot of people don't realize that Vibrio vulnificus, if you have a liver problem and you go in the water that has a Vibrio vulnificus in it, you can die very quickly, like within 24 hours. Uh, there's also a new parasite that's out there. It's an amoeba that you guys may have heard of in, on the news it's called Nigleri fowleri, and it is an amoeba that gets into your brain and chews up your brain. Now, interesting part about those two things is that if you want to find out about them because they're reportable diseases you can find out about that all day long because reportable diseases are easy to find we can track them well cancer we know it tracks very well because you have to uh, all uh, cancer patients once they start receiving therapy are usually on study so that data has to be um, has to be published uh, and it's as uh, and it's very common to be able to get to that information. Also population, because we have census and we know the population, we can track that pretty well. What well, we don't track well, chronic diseases. Why? Because people with chronic diseases don't think they have a disease. Like my patients, they come in and I'll say, so how's your asthma? And they'll say, I don't have asthma. I'm like, yes, you do have asthma. They said, no, I, my asthma is not real because once I'm not wheezing, I don't have asthma anymore. All right, so that's really not true. That's like if people have diabetes, if their sugar's under control, they say they don't have diabetes. That's not true. So we don't track chronic disease very well because people don't like to be, you know, they don't like to admit they have a disease, and that's why we have a problem with it uh, with chronic diseases. And also linking certain types of conditions. People don't like to um, people don't like to people don't like to say what their chronic diseases are. So if you link certain types of conditions, that's what we're not doing much of. So if if you could say, you know. The mold in my house causes asthma, or the cockroach excrement, which is a big uh, trigger for asthma. If that, if you can prove that those two things uh, are to cause and effect, that's where most of the money is out there to be able to get funding. So, if you can prove that, you know, if a child is beaten by his father, then he'll tend to be a serial killer. Okay, then that's something that as a social experiment you could if you could prove that you'll get or try to prove it then you could actually try to get some money for that uh, but linking things very very important all right so use the research is there research related to your issue it's expensive to collaborate with uh, so with institutions it's expensive to do so collaborate with institutions that have epidemiologists that you can utilize some of you guys might be in uh, very rural places right now and so you don't have a statistician so to be able to do research is pretty hard but wherever you are the closest university there will always be someone there that does statistics and they really do want to help you as well as if uh, they don't have a, stat a statistics department the Find the university that's closest to you that does have a statistics department, and then get to the students that are getting masters of public health or getting uh, masters in statistics, and they actually have to do programs and they actually have to do research. And your project that they're that you're working on can they can really help you, and they will actually do it, and they can get information for you, and that can actually help them. So please always use the information that you can get from the universities uh, and the students that are there. Uh, is there research related to your issue? See if there if it already exists. I mean, go to Google and just type in you know type in the the uh, your your topic and just see what's out there because sometimes you know you can actually find that information and you don't have to reinvent the re reinvent the wheel. There's stuff already out there. We want to decrease the work when we try to do a project because increasing the work causes a major problem for you and your family and everybody else because you're not. <laughs> being able to attend to them as well as you would so please make sure that you see if there's research related to your issue but when you look at the research that's out there if you find something say you're trying to say you know that uh, there's a certain type of uh, place where if you live there you'll get cancer all right and if there if there's research on that already in that area see what their population was see what the disease was see if it was evaluated appropriately did is it theory based because I have in my life uh, you know looked and seen I've seen a study that I don't want to use and you know it's really interesting I thought that it was a very important study but then I submitted it as evidence when I was trying to get uh, something published and um, and my friend who is a statistician who I always run things by he said Corey you're not trying to use that study correct I'm like yeah I am he said well 
you, it's called the SMART study. It's an acronym, S-M-A-R-T, but people in, in the uh, statistics biz actually call it the not-so-SMART study because it was just a horrible study, selection bias, p-values less than, not less than 0.05. So I didn't know enough. Uh, so you always make sure that you clear all this with an uh, epidemiologist or a statistician because unless you know exactly about statistics and know how you can make it happen. And did they use appropriate therapy? Once again, theory. It's very important to use this theory when you are figuring out what you need to do. Okay. So develop program or policy options. Review what you, what you already know about the public health program. Uh, you know, right now, if you want to do a project on, you know, uh, mothers uh, and, and how they deal with their newborn babies, where do you think you should go? You should probably go to the WIC clinic in your area because that's where the most of that stuff is, is happening. You know, you have a, um, a mother, you have a newborn, you can go to the OBGYN public health clinics there. Find out when you're, when you're developing your program of policy options, use what you already know about public health. You guys have been in the trenches, you know what you're doing. Make sure you don't have to reinvent the wheel totally. Determine your criteria to prioritize options. You need to know what, you're, what you want to fix. I mean, if you want to uh, uh, look at the, the development of a teenage boy in the ghetto, right, then you're going to say, okay, what's more important? Uh, the way he eats or the violence? or the clothes that he wears. You'd have to say probably the clothes that he wears would probably be on the lower end of the, op of the uh, priority scale, but you've got to remember what is going to be the criteria for determining the, the, uh, the, the uh, priorities. And evaluate the potential cost. We want things to be cost effectiveness. We know the United States came up with a, a, uh, a $2 million study to try to figure out if the penny was necessary. Because they said, why don't we just start rounding things off to the nearest uh, 10 cents and we don't have to uh, use pennies anymore because pennies actually still do have some copper in them and they're expensive to make. So it took, it took $2 million to prove that basically we still do need pennies. Now, to me, that was a cost effective, all right? But we know that uh, the things that you would probably be doing will be cost effective and you're going to have to put, put together a budget. If you've never put together a budget, please talk to someone before you do it and you can put it together. Talk to your, um, your CFO at your clinic uh, because they put together budgets all the time. And if you have never seen your budget in your clinic, please ask and see it because you need to know what's going on at your clinic. You need to be fully invested and aware of what's going on. You can't just be a person that just goes there uh, from 8 to 5 and then leaves because then you'll never be able to get anything done for your community except just the, the, um, the patient care, which sometimes is not enough. Create a plan. At this point, you're in step five. You have to refine your description of the issue. Sometimes your, your issue, you realize once you've gone through all this that your, your issue is actually not what you thought it was. So you have to refine your description of the issue. And go back to your logic model. Put in your inputs. Expand your activities. Refine your outcomes. And then see which behavior theory most is appropriate for you to get started on. And once you do that, you'll be rolling. You can implement. Implementation, once, done, once you've done everything up to step five, uh, implementation is actually the easiest part of it because everything is written down for you to be able to do. Now, evaluation of the program or policy, qualitative, focus groups, town halls, neighborhood walkthroughs and surveys. I'm a big fan of the town hall. The reason why is because if you want to do something in the community, if the people in the community don't know who you are, then they're not going to buy into it. You've got to be one with your community. You have to get the people where they are. You have to let them know that you're vested. So one of the things I actually talk about um, is that I am uh, I talk about if you are in New Orleans, urban area with a lot of African Americans, if you're working there and you don't know who Lil Wayne is, then that's a problem. You need to go buy the CD and listen to it. It may be offensive to some, but you need to know what your patients are thinking about. Just like I, I went to medical school in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, you know, I had to learn who you know, Travis Tritt was. I had to learn who Garth Brooks was because I had a lot of patients that listened to them. And I, I still don't understand why all country music songs end like this. I down, down. <laughs> anyway, they do. So um, it's uh, it's important that you get the people where they are. So you get got to get out there and get uh, get your your boots on the ground, for lack of a better term, and and, and do the neighborhood walkthroughs because you're going to have to evaluate, and you need to do that that way. Quantitative, just the facts. You need to survey participants. We do a uh, a lock-in 
which is at the boys club and we have the boys come in at seven o'clock at night and we have a lawyer a doctor a a uh, policeman a fireman an electrician a brick mason we have everybody anybody in there that that's doing something positive we have a representative and then we lock them in at seven o'clock at night and all night long we tell them how smart they are and how all the things and give them the information on what they want to how they want to uh, achieve their goals in life and they they just need to see people doing this stuff and then we keep them up keep them up all night long and then right when they fall asleep we wake them up again and tell them how smart they are and and um and but before we do any of that before they step through the door we give them a survey and we ask them about a whole bunch of stuff about 200 questions all right and then when they leave before they leave we we give them a survey and see how the differences are before they from when they got there to when they left and also we survey the parents so no matter what you do it that's a before and after survey it's the easiest thing to do but it actually does make it so that you can um, you can get some data because you got to have data uh, I have a question here how do you recommend recruiting participants for a community program I personally think that uh, you have to go out you have to go out into the community and you have to let them know that they and, and make them feel like they can trust you if they trust you then they'll do whatever you ask them to do because nobody really wants to do poorly I always keep that in the back of your mind if you have people that live in really bad areas or they live in the projects or in very rural areas where it's just you know they don't have anything remember that they don't really want to be there there's something that caught them up that made them have to be there so always remember that okay look at the data to help trends um, uh, before program to after program and decide if you need to discontinue or revise at some points like uh, you know we tried to do a lot of programs and when we got to we're trying to evaluate we realized that it just wasn't we, we didn't do it right and we actually had to discontinue we don't want you to have to do that because once you've gotten the funding and you have to discontinue then the odds of you getting funding from that organization again are pretty low what to do now every community is different they vary widely in their interest and ability and, com and commitment to making changes we know that some communities are not ready for change uh, we just implemented in our uh, doctor's office in, in our in my clinic electronic medical records and uh, let me tell you my community in that office was not ready to change they did not not want it because they said it's retard. It's, it's, it, it will it, it retards our ability to be able to uh, see patients uh, see patients appropriately. It retards our ability to be able to bill. It retards our ability to to uh, not waste paper. All kind of things. You know, it was just it was just so bad. You know, and um, and what happens is that when the community is not ready for a change. Uh, then they're, they're going to fight you every every step of the way, and so you got to see if they're ready. And and, and there's ways to uh, evaluate if community is ready. We have another question. Uh, what is the number one tip for how to manage the demands of a research study if I'm working at a CHC? Okay, basically, what you have to do. One of the things, one of the tenets of, of starting a program is that you know that you're going to have to work extremely hard. You're going to have to pull, you know, some 14-hour days. Now I know that, that sounds bad, but we know that uh, there's a book that everybody should read. It's called um, uh, Outliers. It's by Malcolm Gladwell, and uh, it's a very important book because it says you got to put in 10,000 hours for you to be an expert at anything. 10,000 hours. So either you're going to put in 10,000 hours now, or you're going to put them in later, but you got to put in your 10,000 hours. So um, what I would uh, I would recommend that you talk to your CEO. You should definitely make sure that you talk to your CEO uh, and have lunch with your CEO at least once a month because once you can your CEO doesn't want to give you money for this stuff. I'm a CEO, that's how I know. All right. They don't want to um, give you money for this stuff, but if you bring something to the table so it's going to give notoriety to my clinic or it's going to help the people in the community or it's going to make money then you know I'll, I'll set aside time for you to be able to do that in your clinic so that's a very difficult thing to do but it's just going to require a little extra work on your behalf I mean on your part at the very beginning uh, but once you get it started and you surround yourself with positive people which is another thing always surround yourself with people that are on your same wavelength and they want to help you because it's, it's uh, not everybody wants to to do uh, help the community they do want to help you but they don't want to do what it takes so find out who are your hard workers and then make sure that you get that uh, taken care of and surround them okay uh, 
in rural areas, uh, have a, a statement in rural areas, we recruit by going out and meeting church leaders. The people trust their pastors. That's actually, we're going to get to that too, because let me tell you something. Um, if, if the pastor, with, with any downtrodden community, they believe in the church. And I don't know if they believe in the church a lot more because they're not, uh, they're, they're not reaching their full potential right now. So they're trying to do an afterlife or pray or, you know, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a religious person. So I, I go to church too. But the point is that no matter if you're agnostic or Buddhist or whatever, uh, or, or, or Christian, you need to go to the the pastors in your area. Um, I wanted to give. Uh, I worked with the CDC, and we were working on the uh, H1N1 shot. Uh, and so I was in Atlanta, and uh, I, I actually talked to a pastor, and I said, "I want to come to your church." And he had probably five thousand people in the church, and I want them. I want to talk to them about getting H1N1 vaccine. So what I did was I actually got him. Right, right when he was on the pulpit, when he was talking about the H1N1 vaccine, I actually came up, discussed it, and then I said, now, Pastor, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the H1N1 shot while you're on the pulpit. And so he looked at me a little bit crazy, but uh, I actually gave him the shot while he was on the pulpit, while everybody saw it. And when I did that, we got about, um, I think, 3,700 vaccines we gave that day because they wanted to do it because the pastor said it. So that's a very good point. Uh, every every group has different values, norms, and hopes, and every level of community connection is different. And so you got to remember that some established communities may be much more practiced at working together. It's not so easy for newer transient communities. So a lot of times, you guys, uh, you may have heard about the um, the Vietnamese community in New Orleans. The Vietnamese community elected a, a United States congressman. A, the first Vietnamese United States congressman uh, was from New Orleans, and why? Because they had a very Tight knit community. They took care of each other. They communicated. They had. Uh, they went to church together. They uh, they lived together. They had a uh, a newspaper. They had everything. And so it was very it was very easy for them to be able to band together and put someone in office. But in New Orleans right now, we have a community, the Hispanic community. There weren't a lot of Hispanic people before uh, Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans, but after Hurricane Katrina lots and lots and lots of Hispanics came because they were actually working as carpenters and without the Hispanic community New Orleans would not be rebuilt I give them a lot of respect for coming here and helping us rebuild uh, but what has happened is that because a lot of them live in Texas and drive to uh, uh, New, uh, New Orleans or different parts of Louisiana then uh, and a lot of them are undocumented then what happens is that they get paid in cash because they don't want to go to banks because they have to show ID and then they may they feel that that they will get caught if they are undocumented. So on Fridays in New Orleans, the Hispanic community uh, would they would have like uh, 20 assaults on Hispanic workers on Fridays, every Friday in New Orleans. Now why would you say that that would be the case? Because they everyone knew in New Orleans that the Hispanic workers will get paid on Friday they'd have a pocket full of cash and then they would hit them in the head take their money and roll out well uh, I've, uh, the Hispanic community is because it's a little transient in New Orleans right now they they do have a newspaper they do have some outreach they are doing uh, doing some things but they still haven't come together to actually be able to get uh, to leverage the the banks so that they could actually uh, get some um, some uh, documentation to be able to get uh, bank accounts and things like that so they're still being uh, harassed they're still being uh, assaulted because of the money situation so we try to talk to them and they're just they haven't been as ready as uh, some other communities so in about a year I think they will be ready to, to address some of these things but you know when it's a transient population they really don't necessarily uh, have the information that they need or they haven't been as made co made as a cohesive group to be able to, to change some things so always remember to look at that once again, these are stages of community uh, readiness, and this once again is theory, uh, and you can read that. Uh, Dicomente and Prohaska talks about individual readiness, and Warren talks about group readiness. These things are very important because when you look at this stuff, it's um, it's real because uh, what is community readiness? It's the comprehensive health of promotion or change efforts, and they're much more likely to have the desired impact when the health professionals work with local citizens and community leaders when the community is ready better allocation of resources and efforts because you don't duplicate things and it empowers communities to deal with a whole range of issues the more likely to change the community norm and value when you do a program in the community the best the most important thing you want to do is when you walk away from it you you want them to think that you had nothing to do with it you want them to think that they started it because when they feel like they started it then it will have more longevity uh, because it's part of their community so how do you measure community readiness? You have a particular issue or concern is identified. You interview uh, community members. 
you measure readiness your potential, potential strategies are identified and then there's community change and so for example for me uh, my my I think my biggest biggest failure has been uh, I actually worked in the in the St. Bernard housing project when uh, when I was doing my uh, my repayment for the National Service Corps and it was a very interesting place I mean obviously it was a really really uh, downtrodden urban area but one day you know it was about four o'clock in the afternoon and I saw all of a sudden I heard boom and I look outside the door and I realize that someone had been in an accident and when I go outside um, in the middle of the of the, the street you see the 17 year old boy laying in the middle of the street head cracked wide open and uh, he had been hit by a car and he was on a bicycle and uh, his head literally w was cracked open and he didn't have any broken bones or anything but he had a head injury this kid uh, was a straight-A student he uh, was a senior in high school was about to go start University of Alabama he was playing football at University of Alabama he he was a five-letter uh, star in one of the nicest high schools in uh, New Orleans uh, but he lived in the projects he was uh, he was, was went to church every Sunday he was a you know junior deacon he was just the best kid and you knew that he was gonna go to University of Alabama and play professional football and bring all this money back to the projects oh you just knew that well he's just lying there dead now and so everybody in the community oh my god it was just just the worst thing ever um, and so at that point I said you know what if this kid had been wearing a helmet then I know that he would still be alive today. So, and I see that I saw that everybody was out there upset and crying. So I saw that they were ready for the change to make everybody wear helmets in their community. Um, so I uh, I wrote the grant, you know, got the money. We bought four thousand helmets. And I say all that to say that I still have about three thousand helmets. And why is that? Because. I didn't do my research appropriately because what happened? If I'd done my research, I would have realized that if you live in the hood and you're a young black kid, you're a nerd if you wear a helmet. It's just as simple as that. They would not wear the helmets. No matter what I said, and I thought I really wouldn't have to say anything because the person is lying dead on the, on the ground, the, the, the nicest person that lived there. you know. But they were not ready, and if I had really done my research, instead of listening to a loudmouth, as opposed to someone who really knew what they were talking about in the community, then I would have said, what the first thing I should have done is educate the community on the need for helmets, not just give them the helmets. Because I got so tired of seeing helmets used as everything. I saw helmets used as planters. I saw helmets used, you know, for cereal bowls. I mean, I saw helmets used for everything. So, you know, it was just, it was a really bad thing. Very, very depressing for me because I, I just couldn't make it happen. But I will tell you that uh, we ended up giving the helmets to another group and they actually worked with them very well. But, um, and we just did this very recently. But just remember that the community has got to be ready for what you want to give them if they're not ready they're not going to use it dimensions measure, measured look at the community efforts that are already there the programs and policies community knowledge of efforts leadership are they aware and active of the problem community climate are they supportive of the person that's actually trying to change something community knowledge about the issue for example like if you know there was a, an issue where uh, I was in London recently when during those riots you know the community you know if you were trying to do a program and outreach about uh, hypertension and you were a, uh, a a white person from London and you were going into this black community where everybody's rioting because of this you know racial unrest it wasn't a very good time for the community to have a good climate about what you wanted to do All right, so you gotta be very real about this stuff you gotta understand that the community climate is very important if you want them to to um, uh, to to do what they need to do uh, I got a question do you think it's important to participate in an initiative prior to starting your own that's a very good question we're gonna get to that too uh, community knowledge about the issue is very important resources for efforts you got to know has there been time has there been money uh, space allocated for these things you got to know that and the stage of community readiness all right the right now if you want to start from scratch and there's a place where you know that there's no awareness of a problem no awareness that's gonna be hard for you to do because you have to actually make people aware of it then you have to do it you know it or it really may not really be an issue I mean, sometimes things you think are an issue or not just like the whole issue with the um, the uh, transportation uh, for the uh, for the immunizations that we talked about earlier the, Im the the immunization it wasn't an issue it was just transportation so they didn't have any awareness resistance 
That's when some communities are aware. Vague awareness. Most people, most people feel that there's a problem, but there's no immediate motivation to do something about it. I think most people live at vague awareness because they know, you know that you're not supposed to be drinking the devil's urine. That's right. I said the devil's urine. I call soda the devil's urine. Everybody knows that soda's bad for you. There's no reason for anybody to drink it. But you know that it's a problem, but there's really no immediate motivation to do something about it. It's no big deal to you, right? Well, that's where most people live. Pre-planning. There's clear recognition that something must be done, and there may be even a committee. However, efforts are not focused or detailed. This is where um, I think the question that was asked, do you think it's important to participate in an initiative prior to starting your own? I think if you want to if you want to start your own, I think you need to start somewhere like around vague awareness or pre-planning with the issue. If you are at, if it's your first time and you're at the no awareness issue, it's going to be very difficult for you. So if you want to do, if you want to start somewhere, vague awareness or pre-planning is where you need to be. However, if you want to do, if you just want to start, if you want to, you know, join in you can start at the preparation or initiation because right now if you go to prep if you start at the preparation stage you're not going to you're going to be like a bandwagon kind of person people aren't going to really say that you were a part of it and it's not your program but it can actually teach you something uh, so that you can do your own I recommend that if you're looking at the um, at, at, at stage four the stage of readiness that's where you can actually do your own thing. But once you get to five, I think you're going to be more of a person that's helping out as opposed to starting something. Um, at initiation, there's enough information available to justify the efforts. Activities are underway. Obviously, stabilization. Activities supported by administrators. Please, whenever you write your grant, write in some uh, money to be able to pay administration. Because let me tell you something labor is the most important thing you could do anything if you had a thousand people that you wouldn't have to pay to do it all right so just remember always write that in in your budget and always whenever you're but you're doing your budget make sure that you whatever you think your bottom line is double it because you're always going to run out all right uh so make sure you have you you allocate for staff when you do your uh your program confirmation and expansion standard efforts are in place community members feel comfortable using services and a high level of community community ownership remember we mentioned that the level of community ownership is uh is is what you really want because the people think that they did everything when really you probably did most of the work but it doesn't matter you know there are lots of people that have uh, coined the uh, variation of the phrase you know it, there's no telling how high you can how high you can achieve um, if you don't care who gets the credit so then you put it all together. Identify resources, tap the spiritual community, and use the media. I, like I said, I, I'm, I have a radio show as well as uh, several TV uh, shows, and I use the media for everything. We had a, a program where we wanted to raise money for some books. We wanted to buy books for the kids, and we couldn't raise the money. So what I did was set up a, a lemonade stand right in the front of my clinic, which was on a, a major thoroughfare, and we built this uh, for about 10 bucks. We built this, uh, this uh, stand, and it was a lemonade stand. And basically on the top of the lemonade stand, we made the kids have a banner. And the banner said, we are trying to raise money so that we can read. We're trying to raise money so that we can buy a book so we can read, okay? And then I called the newspaper and I called the television station. So can you imagine when the television station is covering these poor, you know, uh, kids that don't have anything and they're trying to sell lemonade so they can raise $5,000 to buy books so they can read? We ended up getting $20,000 out of that. So use the media because they actually can tap the people that need to be tapped. You need to inspire. If more, if I can't say one more thing about inspiration, when people walk away from you, after you tell them what you need to tell them about your program, you, when they walk away from you, you need to. They need to feel like, wow, that's a great program, and that person, that that person's really doing a great job. That's what you need to do. If people walk away from you and they say, eh, that seems okay, you need to either change your, uh, the way that you're delivering it or change your program because you need to be able to inspire people to do great things. There's, and you can go to workshops on this, but you, but you are part of the National Service Corps, so you need to be able to, to get out there and get in contact with people and get them to, to feel what you're doing out there. And to initiate, you must advocate. Um, advocacy, what is advocacy? We know that 
every program that we want to start nobody wants to just start their program and just have it in their community because if you think it's a good enough program for your community you really kind of want it to be a, a, a law you want it to be you know out in in the United States you want it to be something that uh, Michelle Obama says this is very important so to do that you have to advocate because you have to get to politicians you have to get to policy makers it's very important you've got to do that so how do you advocate the advocacy cycle? Um, I, I really think uh, one of my other big failures was seats in school buses. You ever notice why there's no seats in school buses? The American Academy of Pediatrics has never really done a big study. There are a couple of people that have done studies, and the studies show that if you, and the studies are very weak, show that if a person, if a kid is strapped in because the kid's atlanto axial instability, I'm sorry. The kid's atlanto uh, axial instability is so weird uh, that if a kid gets hit, it, uh, or gets uh, if a bus gets hit, and a school bus gets hit, a kid is more likely to go unconscious. And if a kid is strapped in and he goes unconscious, if the bus catches on fire, then the kid is more likely to die. Okay, whatever. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if you know if the kid has head trauma and he's passed out, whether he is strapped in or not. He, he's gonna die if the school if the school bus you know catches on fire. So anyway, make a long story short with this, I've been every place in the world, and from the United States Senate to the you know Louisiana State Senate Congress talking about seats in school buses. I still have not gotten enough traction to say that you know that, that somebody a senator wants to take this under his belt and say I'm gonna make this happen. Still to this day, it's very difficult to make it happen, and uh, I, I'm trying. Uh, but right now. I, you know, you've got to advocate so that you can make policy. If you don't make policy, you're only affecting change in your own own community, and that's not good enough. Here's the advocacy cycle, and you see uh, when you have the uh, analyze the problem. You have to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, problem identification. Uh, analyze the problem, uh, identify solutions, assess outcomes. But obviously, you have to act, which is very important at the beginning, at the bottom rather. Always remember responsible funding organizations. If you are doing a health fair, try not to get Coca-Cola and McDonald's to sponsor you, okay? Uh, if you have to get them, then get them as opposed to not having the health fair. But I want you to try to get other, uh, other people to try to support it. Local banks are great. Local people don't realize that local banks from local banks that are of national chains have about $50,000 in their budget to give for outreach for community um, programs so go to your local bank of um, Capital One or um, uh, anyone anyone uh, to be able to say you know you want to do a local uh, program and they actually have the money that you can actually do it all right uh, and competition among funding organizations is helpful only when it improves the care of the community so you want them to compete for you because we know that uh, that when you uh, have comp competition between people that want to give you money, then your amount of money you can get is actually probably higher. The values, you got to have integrity, credibility, fairness, responsibility, aspects of patient advocacy. We're getting kind of close here. So um, you got to have patience, passion, persistence, and patience. That's my big thing because you, I don't want you guys to go out there and try to start this stuff and you are not... Um, uh, and you don't have the, the patience. This is not an easy thing to do, but it is possible for you to be able to do if you follow these steps that I'm giving you. Uh, we do have a question here. Uh, people prefer to deny social problems that are considered bad. Doesn't happen in our community. Uh, STDs, drug, alcohol, alcohol abuse, uh, poverty. Our challenge is reframing health issues so that they can empower communities, not bring communities down. Focus on the strengths and normalize problems. A challenge to do. I totally agree. Just like when we were talking about, you know, people with chronic diseases. They don't want to believe that they have a chronic disease so <laughs> because it makes them feel like they have a disease. So we have to empower people to know that there's a way to get out of that. And that's one of those things that when we talked about that lock-in, we empower those kids to realize that when they see, and this is in the black community, they see me as a black doctor. They're like, wow, I never met a black doctor before. You know, they see a, a, a black lawyer. I've never met a black lawyer before. So when they actually are empowered to do things, then they can say, wow, I can do it. And that's what we have to fight for. All right. I think we are. Here we go.
patience and personal experiences. We uh, we don't have time to talk about the lost kids at home, but um, I actually started a, a program called Urban Pediatrics on my own money with with my own money on my own time when I was an intern, and now I work for NBC because you're going to have these defining moments in your life, and, and one of them I had to pay $300 a month for this show when I was only making $22,000 a year. My wife wasn't too happy about it, but I knew that that was my calling, and now uh, – I'm on TV all the time talking to millions of people every day about health issues and sometimes you have to step up and do what you need to do. So you got to have the passion. We talked about that. Consistent values, persistence. You know that these complex systems and people are going to be very resistant to change and you got to build the bridge for patient advocacy. So we're very close to ending here. Um, patience, take t patience takes time. Don't become frustrated and cynical. Trust me. You know, there are a lot of conspiracy issues out there. And uh, and one uh, one physician or clinician can make a change. you got to have leadership and financial and get resources. Now, I'm, I was getting through this really quickly because I want you guys to see this this uh, as a wrap-up. You know that you have, uh, when I've done this, I've really been able to um, make whatever program I'm trying to do very very successful so the first thing you do you have your problem I want you to talk to your professional society so if you're a social worker go to your professional society and say you know what this is my program what do you think about it and they're gonna tell you what they think about it and hopefully it's a good thing and so that's where we are right here professional societies and then you get your media relations together you talk to your your uh, radio sh your radio personalities you talk to your television personnel you talk to your newspaper people and you tell them what you're about to do or what you're trying to do and then you talk to your foundations you try to send this trying to send all your information in so you can try to get funded and then you go to your pol policy analysis of your professional society. So once you are sending this stuff in to all these foundations, go back to your professional society and say, what do you think about my grant proposal? See if they think it's good because they've done this before. And then you start to collaborate with people because uh, and the collaborations could be with personal friends or with uh, other clinics because or, or other organizations because you've got to collaborate because you can't do this all on your own. Then once you do that, you build the bridge for patient advocacy. You have key patient advocates. You put them in, in this place because you got to have the loudmouth person who knows what they're talking about. So if you're trying to do something on asthma, you need to have somebody who whose child died of asthma being a big, big person that's going to be an advocate for you. You got to have voters because we know voters make change and change policy. Then you got to get the business leaders because the business leaders are the people that actually give money to the politicians and also uh attract voters because the, when the business leaders talk they talk with money and then voters will listen because the politicians are listening so with that being said once you have the business leaders and you have your politicians that'll make your vision become a reality because the politicians state legislators and congress are the people that actually vote and actually uh, can get a policy made and a law change so that your uh, program will be very successful and hopefully uh, help all of our populations in the United States and abroad. With that being said, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, guys. Uh, my name is Corey Abair, and I want you to know that if you have any questions about this, uh, if you Google me or if you go to drcoreyabair.com, you can uh, email me and I will send you, I will turn this information back around to you and answer your questions. But if you want questions now, you actually can uh, can answer some now. Um, I have one, I mean, I can ask, you can, I will answer some now. Uh, Richard Gooden says, What do you recommend? for those who are in a situation when leadership doesn't offer su support but you know the work you want to do is right for the community um, when you talk about leadership the leadership if, if your leadership in your community doesn't support you you have to be the leadership in that community meaning that you have to find people uh, uh, that are that think the same way you think and then once you go to the media and it's a very valid problem there are very valid concern you're having and you've done your footwork uh, then that leadership will follow I've never had a time even though I've had very very difficult um, people that I've had to present to and, and work with once I got things going and it was going to make a difference in people's lives then my leadership actually did change but sometimes you have to be that leader and just step out on your own and that's just what we have to do with that being said there are there any more questions not so far but some people may be typing in the queue as we are waiting I would like to take this time just to say thank you very much Dr. Abair for your time tonight and for lending your um, expertise I, I wanted to ask you I mean I know how old you are but it, it's amazing that you could have accomplished so much in the 
few years that you've been around, I don't know how you actually see patients with all of this other stuff that you do. So, um, would like to say. Well, I, actually, I'm seventy. I'm seventy-seven years old. <laughs> I hope I look good for my age. <laughs> all right, let's see if there are any more questions. I also would like to take this time now for to announce to our audience that tomorrow we will have a, a coffee shop. It'll be the primary care coffee shop. So I'm not sure how many of you, um, what your specialties are, but tomorrow we'll be talking about childhood obesity, prevention and treatment. And it's going to be a panel discussion. It'll be a, clin a, um, a primary care clinician who will give her perspective, as well as two other people who are doing community involvement, as well as um, someone who's developed a program to get parents involved in dealing with the issue of childhood obesity. So please join in with us. It'll be tomorrow night again, um, Thursday, August 25th from 8 to 9 Eastern Time. And then I would like to invite you guys out next week, Wednesday, which will be the 31st, to um, hear a webinar presentation that CE approved on STD uh, prevention. And she will um, announce the updates that came out last year, 2010, from the CDC. So I think we do have another question. How may they get a copy of my presentation? Um, the National Service Corps can give it to you, um, or I can send it to you. If you go to my email, uh, if you go to drcoryabear.com and go to contact me, I can send it to you. I don't have a problem with that at all. Awesome. Well, Dr. Aber, your your voice lasted. I was I'm really um, surprised about that. So good job. I think we have another question. <laughs> yeah. I may not speak too soon. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Aber, for your helpful webinar. I intend to review for more thorough consideration. Thanks again. Someone thanking me, and I and thank you guys. I appreciate you that when I do stuff like this, you guys um, yeah, invigorate me, so I can go and change the world just like you. Oh yeah, they're coming in now. <laughs> it will be available via the on-demand section of the PCFA website. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. So I'd also be remiss if I didn't say thanks to our IT team tonight, Jerry and Qualen. Thanks, you guys really helped this to go. And no, 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 you make it go. So thanks very much. Um, I would. I need to give some. Um, thank you again to our sponsors. This partnership allows primarycareforall.org to serve as a resource for you, the National Health Service Corps members. Um, it's made possible through a partnership between the National Center for Primary Care, Migrant Clinicians Network, the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and Clinical Directors Network. Direct financial support for this webinar is made possible through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration, and the Bureau of Clinician Recruitment and Services. And last but not least, an evaluation for this webinar will pop up in another window if you're using Internet Explorer or another tab if you're using Firefox. Please take the time to complete it because your CE um, is tied to it. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening and we hope to see some of you guys tomorrow night. Goodbye. Bye.